Okay, yeah, thank you very much uh, for uh, joining uh, today's uh, uh, TSVP uh, seminar. Uh, the speaker for today is uh, Dr. Srikanth uh, Ramaswamy. Yeah, so I know Srikanth uh, since uh, he was uh, a student of uh, OCNC uh, some time ago. <laughs> yeah, and then I, saw, I also knew him as a, a core member of the Blue Brain Project to uh, construct a, a detailed, a complete model of a, a cortical column. So, uh, and then the, he got the kind of independent uh, research position uh, at the uh, Newcastle University, uh, running his own lab now. And then uh, recently, his uh, research interested more and more into uh, like a neuromodulators which I have been working on for uh, many years. So I'm very glad that uh, his proposal to uh, hold a thematic uh, TSVP program this summer was accepted. Mm -hmm. So, and he's uh, uh, starting a, a symposium in early July mm -hmm. and then continue on with a couple of uh, workshops uh, in the summer. Yeah. And then uh, today, so he is uh, kind of uh, giving an introductory talk uh, of uh, his uh, ideas. So uh, the title uh, is, uh, What Can Upshare Neural Networks uh, Learn from Neuromodulatory Systems? So Srikans, please start your talk. Okay. Uh, so uh, uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Kenji-san. It's a pleasure to be back here after, after many, many years. It's kind of uh, uh, paying back. Um, so today, um, I'll, I'll try and touch upon some very preliminary work um, on a, on a data-driven bottom-up modeling approach that incorporates um, cellular, synaptic, and dendritic diversity um, in mammalian cortical circuits uh, to peel out the effects of uh, neuromodulatory signaling um, and, and then try and link how these effects could relate to um, advances in uh, learning and memory and information representation in artificial neural networks. So this is a bit of a, a blast from the past. So this was almost, I don't know, like uh, maybe about 15, 16 years ago. So you know when one of the the very 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 first um, installments of the OCNC, which of course, as you all know, has um, um, become um, a leading a course in uh, computational neuroscience. Uh, so yes, this is all um, where uh, it started at the Seaside House when I guess this campus was still being uh, constructed. Uh, nevertheless, okay. So um, some of you might um, might might agree, and 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 some not. But I think uh, this is a fairly contemporary depiction uh, of modern neuroscience. So what we see here are cave men and women who are doing their own little thing. You know, perhaps. Um, they're all measuring some neuromodulator in some part of the brain, in some species, without realizing that they're all doing the same thing. Um, so what if, um, you know, these cave people were given a little magic wand that could make them realize that they're all doing the same thing, but they could all do it together, right? So if we could somehow integrate all the sparse um, or other the data, the disparate data that these cave people are gathering. So how could we do that? So one of the ways forward is to try and build a framework where we start from sparse data um, at, the, at the level of um, ion channels or neuron morphologies, uh, neuronal physiology, their connectivity and network activity, um, identify certain rules and principles of organization in these multi-scale sparse data sets, um, 
and uh, really try and use these rules and principles to constrain algorithms that would enable us to build computational models of these building blocks, these building blocks of microcircuits across across different levels, right? Um, so what we're trying to do here with such an approach, starting from sparse experimental data to come up with a dense computational reconstruction of some part of the brain is to is to really call is to really try and solve or or to take a jab at at solving um, the so-called inverse problem uh, in physics. Uh, so how can we use um, this approach uh, of going from sparse to dense to understand um, a process that is as complex as neuromodulation? Right? So let me let me quickly walk walk you through what this is. So neuromodulation is a, is a very complex phenomenon to study in the brain as, as, as Kenji and, and, and Sam and, and Yuki and many others in the audience would, would attest to, to, to my, my statement. Um, and simulation-based approaches uh, try and, and make the, the problem of understanding the brain somewhat more tractable. And computational methods provide ways to integrate um, what is known and to predict what is difficult to measure. So, so the way I'd like to put this is uh, building detailed computational models could provide ways to integrate the known knowns to predict the known unknowns in, in some part of the brain. Uh, so most of, most of this detailed modeling work uh, was done by my first PhD student, uh, Christina Colangelo at EPFL, who, who graduated uh, last year. Um, and this work builds on, on three uh, preprints um, that are somewhere out there, you know, in the maze of the review process, um, identifying how neuromodulatory systems are organized in uh, cortical microcircuits, uh, and how can we scale this up starting from one microcircuit to something that's more bigger, like a brain region, like the somatosensory cortex. Okay, so uh, to walk you through very quickly uh, about neuromodulation. So what is neuromodulation? Uh, so simply put, it's a form of neurotransmission and neuromodulators can act through a variety of receptors whose time scales of activation can lead to very differential effects in, in various contexts. And the release of neuromodulators, of course, mediates cognitive processes. And these neuromodulators regulate cellular and synaptic activity to uh, reconfigure network states. So to the right here is a, is a little cartoon of um, a cholinergic axon, you know, um, uh, a process that releases a neuromodulator called acetylcholine into the cortex. Um, and this cholinergic axon contains these packets, vesicles, um, with uh, acetylcholine molecules. Uh, when instructed through some signal, these cholinergic packets diffuse across the synaptic cleft and are picked up by different postsynaptic receptors that are sitting somewhere on the dendrites of target neurons. And depending on um, the kind of receptor, the kind of neuron type, where they are sitting, uh, the effects of acetylcholine can occur across different timescales. Um, and of course, an interesting question is why acetylcholine, right? Um, so there are at least five major neuromodulators in the, in the central nervous system. I like to call these the big five. Um, histamine, acetylcholine, noradrenaline, dopamine, and serotonin. So the mnemonic to try and remember these is hands. Um, acetylcholine is probably the most exhaustively studied neuromodulator, at least in the sensory cortex. And um, it acts as a neurotransmitter uh, at the neuromuscular junction. And these were 
experiments that were done by Bernard Katz um, many, many, many decades ago at uh, University College London. Um, and acetylcholine modulates the activity of cortical neurons in immediate ways, a lot of ways, um, most of which we don't understand. Nevertheless, uh, so this cartoon here on the right shows the projection targets of cholinergic neurons from a little nucleus called the basal forebrain, which really sits in the base of the forebrain, the mammalian forebrain, and sends all these axons that target different cortical regions. Uh, so what does, what does acetylcholine actually do? Um, so many things. Uh, it supports state transitions, a variety of behaviors. It's involved um, in um, uh, the pathophysiology of Alzheimer's disease. And uh, it also leads to agonism, for example, disrupted cholinergic release uh, that produces delirium-like symptoms. Uh, and it's released from the basal forebrain and its innovation is quite wi widespread throughout the cortical mantle. And this is just a little snapshot of the, of the myriad things that the cholinergic system actually does. So in a nutshell, it does everything. It modulates processes from wakefulness to arousal to sensory processing, attention, memory, you name it. Acetylcholine is probably involved in doing that in the, in the mammalian cortex. Um, so what's the, uh, the functional organization of these, of these cholinergic projections? Uh, so there are at least three major cholinergic nuclei in the mammalian brain. So the foremost is the basal forebrain, also referred to sometimes as the so-called uh, nucleus basalis of Minard. And projections, axons from the basal forebrain mostly target uh, the neocortex, the prefrontal cortex uh, that's involved in association or the neocortex that's mostly involved in processing sensory information. However, there are also other cholinergic nuclei like in the, in the medial septum of the hippocampus uh, that send projections to various regions of the, of the hippocampal formation, as well as cholinergic nuclei uh, in the, in the so-called pedunculopontine nucleus um, of, the, of the brain, which is quite deep from the cortex. So these projections from the pedunculopontine nuclei can target various um, brain regions uh, that are below the, the thalamus. Uh, so there are actually two forms of, of cholinergic release um, in the brain. Uh, so one is um, the so-called quintessential uh, synaptic release, you know, where uh, these cholinergic axons come very close uh, to some part of the postsynaptic uh, formation like dendrites or the soma and form explicit physical appositions or synaptic contacts uh, to release acetylcholine through these synaptic contacts. On the other hand, an other form of cholinergic release is um, through uh, so-called volumetric transmission where a cholinergic axon projecting from the basal forebrain, let's say, ends up somewhere in the cortex, but does not form specific synaptic contacts, but it's like a fire hose that's projecting to somewhere in the cortex. And when required, it just releases, it sprays, spritzes acetylcholine that are then picked up by different uh, neurons or elements within, within this area. Um, so, there, there has been a lot, a lot of debate about these two release modalities of acetylcholine in the cortex over decades. But of course, this is neuroscience, so nothing has been established yet. Uh, so here uh, is a cartoon of a cholinergic axon that could be releasing acetylcholine both through synaptic um, uh, mechanisms as well as volumetric mechanisms. 
And these are the salient differences of acetylcholine release through synaptic and volumetric mechanisms. Um, I won't go through all this in detail, but just to summarize, uh, synaptic release, uh, of course, occurs through junctions, through, uh, through appositions of axons and dendrites, but volumetric release is non-junctional. Uh, it's, it's, it's very unspecific. Um, and synaptic release could be considered as one-to-one, -one, very specific. Volumetric release is one-to-many, very unspecific. So there is also um, a direct relation to transmission timelines in that synaptic release is associated with fast time uh, timelines and uh, volumetric release is associated with slow timelines. And there are also metabolic costs because forming synapses in the brain um, metabolically is very expensive. Uh, but releasing a neuromodulator uh, through volumetric transmission is metabolically inexpensive. Um, and, and again, um, you know, just to highlight the fact that uh, this is pretty much an unsettled issue in modern neuroscience. Um, there have been many, many, many studies um, through the years. And some of these studies uh, have tried to establish the proportion of cholinergic release um, versus synaptic or volumetric transmission. Some studies say that about two thirds of uh, cholinergic release occurs synaptically, but some studies say that no, it's about a third. Um, there is some evidence of fast cholinergic signaling, which is compatible with synaptic transmission. However, there is also some evidence for non-synaptic transmission present as well. So this is, you know, very murky. So very, very murky waters. And unfortunately, we do not have a sufficient um, depth with current methodological approaches uh, that could tell us um, how cholinergic release is mediated by synaptic or volumetric transmission. So this is very much an open-ended question in modern neuroscience. Um, so to try and understand uh, the effects of cholinergic release synaptically and volumetrically, we started by doing a huge literature search uh, to try and summarize what do we know about uh, cholinergic release in the cortex um, in terms of um, their, uh, in terms of cholinergic uh, effects on uh, the properties of single neurons. Uh, so what you see on the left here are different cortical cell types, uh, like pyramidal cells or basket cells or Martinotti cells. Uh, the cholinergic receptor involved, what's the fundamental effect on these neurons? Uh, the brain region, the species, and, and the approaches that were used to try and understand these effects. Uh, I won't go into these um, uh, details. This is published work, so you can, you can take a look um, uh, whenever you want. Uh, again, we also tried to do the same to understand um, what nicotinic receptors uh, has against muscarinic receptors could be doing to different cell types to um, mediate cholinergic uh, release in the cortex. So what's the effect? Uh, does cholinergic receptor release um, through uh, muscarinic versus nicotinic? What does it do to a neuron in the, in the cortex? Um, and this is a, a cartoon summarizing all that we found. And, um, and frankly, um, this is quite a zoo because this is a very, very complicated picture. So even a single neuromodulator like acetylcholine can have very, very different effects based on the kind of receptor it recruits on uh, a cell type in the cortex, right? So this is actually a very microscopic picture. So imagine if we were to try and uh, build such a cartoon for the whole brain, like we would be totally, totally lost. 
Um, nevertheless, so this is what we pretty much know about acetylcholine and its effects on different neuron types um, in the in the cortical microcircuit. And, and similarly, we also did the same for synaptic connections where we tried to look at what acetylcholine could be doing um, to pairs of, of neurons, pairs of connected neurons. Um, and again, um, this is quite, quite, quite a, a complex picture uh, because depending on the neuron, the layer where these receptors are, acetylcholine is doing you know, um, a lot of different things. Um, so if it's a layer two, three pyramidal cell, the effects of acetylcholine could be facilitating. But if it's a layer five pyramidal cell, then the effects of acetylcholine could be depressing. Um, and this is really skimming the surface because, you know, uh, there are many, many more neuron types in the cortex and we're just beginning to appreciate the, the complexity of this diversity of cell types. Uh, so what we then tried to do was to uh, integrate all this data on the cellular and the synaptic diversity of the effects of acetylcholine into a detailed model of the, of the neocortex. Um, so this is again a previously published work. Um, and um, what we did, um, was to build on this very, very, oops, sorry. Uh, so what we did was to um, uh, build on this um, very detailed model of the, of the neocortex uh, that consists of about 31,000 neurons, uh, 55 different neuron types. Uh, I won't go into all these numbers, but just to try and give you a metaphor, so this whole model could probably correspond uh, to the size of um, a grain of sand or a pinhead in the mouse brain. And already, you know, given such a small volume, this model is pretty complex because it tries to encapsulate a lot of um, details about particle microcircuitry. Um, and so just to, just to give you a nutshell of these numbers, so there are about 31,000 neurons packed in, into this volume. That's roughly 0.3 millimeter cube, a grain of sand or a pinhead. And this consists of about 55 different neuron types, 40 million synaptic contacts, uh, and 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 many 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 other details. Uh, so of course um, we tried to integrate all this data at the cellular and the synaptic level, but we we had no idea about what a neuromodulator like acetylcholine could be doing at the network level. Um, so some previous studies have actually shown um, that. If you um, try and uh, you know uh, put in uh, electrodes to record uh, neuronal activity into the into the mouse or the rat brain, um, then uh, depending on where this electrode is placed, let's say at the at the nucleus basalis, which is um, one of the most important cholinergic uh, centers that project to the cortex. Uh, so when an animal is, is really uh, not doing anything in the, in the controlled state, sticking an electrode into the, into the nucleus basalis, um, stimulating um, uh, or, or rather recording cortical activity leads to uh, something that's mostly um, synchronous, where neurons are all firing at once, you know, where there is uh, what could be termed as network synchrony. But on the other hand, when you stimulate uh, neurons in the nucleus basalis, right, to do something, 
when you inject an electrical current in the in the in the nucleus basalis then the activity of neurons in the cortex shifts from something that's more synchronous uh, to something that's more asynchronous so uh, one metaphor i could give in the real world here is synchronous activity could be something like a chorus in an orchestra where everyone is singing together but asynchronous activity could be uh, related to um, uh, you know uh, soloists in an orchestra where people are singing individually right so what acetylcholine is doing in the cortex is to shift network activity from something that's very synchronous to something that's more asynchronous right so again um, uh, the plots here to the right actually show the change in the power spectrum density um, without acetylcholine and with acetyl acetylcholine so uh, what you can see here is that the power spectrum density uh, so the y-axis here is on the logarithmic scale. Um, the power spectrum density here um, actually is increased with cholinergic release. So that seems to suggest that acetylcholine is bringing about this change in network states where it's driving neurons that are mostly synchronous uh, to doing something that's mostly asynchronous. So it's kind of uh, pushing these neurons to do something out of their comfort zone, right? Uh, again, um, other groups have also shown similar effects uh, through uh, optogenetic techniques, for example. So this is a study from Young Dance Group um, where um, they showed that without uh, the activation of cholinergic neurons, network activity is very synchronous uh, but 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 then with the activity of or rather with the activation of cholinergic neurons, network activity is more more asynchronous. And so, uh, with all this knowledge, we then try to ask questions on how is the cholinergic system organized in the cortex? So, uh, what are the different cell types that are innovated? Uh, how many neurons could a cholinergic fiber contact? Uh, is acetylcholine released via volumetric transmission or synaptic transmission? Uh, is there a prevalence between one of these modes? And what are the relative contributions of these two transmission modalities? And can we actually agree on the cell type specific effects of cholinergic release? And can all this gargantuan data be integrated into a coherent framework, a coherent modeling framework that could tell us what acetylcholine might be doing in the, in the cortex? Uh, but a key piece of this puzzle that we were missing uh, was on the anatomy of cholinergic projections. Um, so I, I kind of uh, flew you through uh, the physiological effects of acetylcholine in the cortex, but how are these axons actually structured? How are these organized in the cortex? So this was a key piece uh, of missing data. And we reached out to our collaborator, Javier de Felipe, who's um, uh, a well-known uh, neuroanatomist at the Cajal Institute in Madrid. And Javier, did these uh, immunohistochemical studies to try and peel out the projections of cholinergic axons in a, in a prototypical cortical microcircuit. And Javier also said that, okay, if I can do acetylcholine, I can also do other neuromodulators like dopamine and serotonin, but I'll only, I'll only try and focus on, on acetylcholine to keep things simple. Um, so Javier then, um, provided us data on uh, the distributions of cholinergic axons across different cortical layers and how these cholinergic varicosities are also distributed across layers. 
So there, there seems to be a pattern of how these cholinergic axons are distributed across cortical layers and uh, also their, their release. Um, and um, so, of course, we, we don't really have uh, an explicit model of the basal forebrain, uh, but we modeled these cholinergic axons as virtual projections that target the, the, the cortical microcircuit. And uh, we, we made several assumptions um, in this uh, modeling uh, framework. So we assumed that single uh, cholinergic axons uh, can release acetylcholine both synaptically as well as volumetrically, uh, simply because we don't have the data to try and tell us what's the proportion of cholinergic axons that can release acetylcholine synaptically versus volumetrically. Um, and um, a lot of this work is, is, is still in progress. It's evolving. We don't have all the results yet. But what we found um, is that um, a combination of synaptic and, and volumetric release is actually necessary to move the activity of, of the cortex from something that's more synchronous to something that's more asynchronous. So um, the, the red dashed line here is, is really the boundary. Uh, to the left is cortical activity before the release of acetylcholine. And to the right is cortical activity after the release of acetylcholine in this model. And we, we played around with a, with a few combinations of synaptic versus volumetric release in this model. And, and, and what we find is that a combination of synaptic versus volumetric release is necessary to move the cortex from highly synchronized states to highly asynchronous states. And um, what could this imply, of course? You know, that's, that's, a, that's an important question. So this could imply that uh, the temporal properties of um, neuromodulatory signaling could govern uh, the emergence of network activity in cortical states. Or to, to put this down um, a bit simpler, a combination of synaptic versus volumetric release is essential to bring about uh, a change in cortical activity uh, from synchrony uh, to asynchrony. Um, and, and of course, uh, as I said, this is work in progress. So these are model predictions. But we went a step further to try and see if some of these model predictions can, can stand on their own weight. And what we did here uh, was uh, to try and validate some of um, the model predictions uh, in terms of um, the power ratio of network oscillations uh, either through synaptic release, volumetric release, or a mix of synaptic and volumetric transmission, and then compare what the model predicts with um, experimental studies out there. And what we actually see is that more often than not, the model seems to be, the model predictions are quite consistent with experimental observations. So that gives us some confidence that uh, you know, all this uh, willy-nilly detailed modeling that we are trying to do holds some relevance and that this could actually be an initial step to try and understand what neuromodulators like acetylcholine could be doing by acting across cells and synapses and dendrites to shape network activity in the cortex. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Uh, how can shift from the synchronous one to the asynchronous one? So, what changes the dark dynamics? And without reducing firing rate, right? Yes. So yes. For how it is possible? 
so that's uh, so reducing firing rate is is one uh, oh, well, it, yes, it, so uh, again, the effects of acetylcholine are differential. So depending on the neuron type, uh, the same amount of acetylcholine in the same brain region can either enhance filing rate or decrease filing rate, right? So that's one face of the coin. And on the other hand, again, depending on the synaptic connection type, the release of acetylcholine can either facilitate synaptic transmission or depress synaptic transmission. And uh, it's a combination of the effects of acetylcholine on the firing rate of neurons and the synaptic physiology of neurons mm. that's bringing about these changes um, that are broadcast at the network state. So again, uh, I mean, this is something uh, that we don't know yet because the uh, uh, a typical cortical microcircuit has 31,000 neurons. Mm. And if you were to classify these 31,000 neurons into some type, into some shape, then they would boil down to about 55 different neuron types. And theoretically speaking, let's say um, these 55 different neuron types can all connect to each other. So that's 55 square or 3025 connection combinations. But uh, from biology, we know that not all of these 3025 combinations are actually viable. And uh, the number of viable connection types could boil down to about 2000, right? And uh, this is not a trivial number uh, to measure experimentally uh, because the, the method of choice to characterize uh, synaptic physiology in the cortex has been through paired recordings where you inject an electrode into a presynaptic neuron and try and measure the response in a postsynaptic neuron and try and do this over many, many, many different connection types. Right, so uh, this is more like a fishing expedition because it's very low throughput. And of course, you, you can do it because it's fun, but at the end of the day, it's not going to tell us much. Um, and over 70 years of doing such experiments, we only know what roughly maybe about 20% of these synaptic connections could be doing. And we know even less about what acetylcholine could be doing on these synaptic connections. So um, we're, we're dealing with very sparse data here. And I think uh, we need to come up with, with clever ways to try and understand what even a single neuromodulator like acetylcholine could be doing to different cell types in the cortical microcircuit um, and trying to extrapolate this to other cell types. Like otherwise, you know, we, we, we'll, we'll keep doing these experiments forever and, and there's no end. So that's the point. I mean, maybe, maybe this was way too much detail, but uh, I, I wanted to project the, the current state of the art. So in, in your figure, you show the like, one axon in the one column. Right. But uh, in the uh, average, how many axons uh, can a single column receive? Right. So this is one neocortical column, roughly. Um, so the x-axis could be about um, 300 to 400 microns. And based on... Uh, the seminal work by uh, Vernon Mountcastle and others, um, this huge uh, forest of uh, cortical neurons can be subdivided into so-called mini columns, right? So uh, on average, uh, a neocortical column, uh, this uh, intimidating structure in the, in the, in the rodent brain uh, could be kind of um, uh, dumbed down to about 300 mini columns. Mm -hmm. uh, and one assumption we made 
in this uh, whole modeling approach is that each mini column receives one cholinergic axon. I see. So that is a realistic number based on the density of the cholinergic fiber. Approach. Yes, 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 yes. Based on the density of the cholinergic fibers and based on, on how they are distributed across the different layers. And uh, for such, such a uh, axon, do they have synapse uh, with uh, most of the neurons in the mini column or uh, actually synaptic connections uh, to limit the number of neurons? Right. So this question, um, I mean, that, that's, a, that's a million dollar jackpot question. We don't know. So what we assume here is that the same axon in one mini column um, can have can establish about 50% synaptic contacts to release acetylcholine, and 50% of acetylcholine is released by volumetric transmission. Mm -hmm. So this is a trade-off because we simply don't know the numbers. Yeah. We, I mean, th th this is something that that needs to be answered. We uh, we don't have. Uh, but for example, yeah. in the case of a 50-50, so do most of the neurons uh, receive uh, at least one synaptic connection or some of them do not uh, receive a synaptic connection just to rely on the volumetric uh, transmission? No, most neurons would receive at least one synaptic connection. Yes, yes. yes. And, and would the 50-50 vary between... Uh... Like, uh, so you're saying that it's 50% 50, 50 synaptic mm -hmm. uh, connections, 50% uh, mm -hmm. volumetric. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Would that number, would that proportion vary depending on where, you know, uh, different regions? And, uh... For sure, for sure. So this is um, um, an assumption we made in a, in a very small part of the cortex. So this is an assumption we made in the developing rat somatosensory cortex. Right. Uh, this is the primary somatosensory cortex. Of course, um, this doesn't consider the barrel cortex, which is a slightly different formation, although it is within the somatosensory area. Uh, or the, the secondary somatosensory cortex can also be different. And this um, is a model of the developing a rat somatosensory cortex, which means uh, we we use data from uh, animals that are about two to three weeks postnatal, um, and and rats. So if we were to try and do this all over again um, in mice in the somatosensory cortex, corresponding to a similar um, developmental time scale uh, to rats, like the juvenile cortex, then it's probably going to be different. And uh, for sure, it's going to be different in the visual cortex, the motor cortex, the prefrontal cortex. So, do you have any idea like what areas would bias which proportion? Probably the sensory areas would be kind of similar, yeah. although there are going to be some nuances for sure. Yeah. But the association areas, um, in my opinion, would be quite different from the sensory areas. Again, the, the thing is, these are characterization studies, so they are not the most glamorous things to do out there. However, they are fundamental, and if someone were to rise to this challenge, then I think we would have a lot of very, very interesting data comparing how these projections differ uh, between regions. Yeah. Thank you. So uh, in this uh, like a complex uh, extracellular space, do you have a realistic estimate of the uh, diffusion constant of the Assist scoring? Yes, um, uh, we do. I mean, uh, we measured the, the diffusion constant of acetylcholine um, by trying to develop a model uh, with concentric regions of interest and then kind of trying to fit a Gaussian to see how, depending on where you are in this content, concentric volume, volume of the cortex, uh, would acetylcholine release differ? Uh, so yes, we did that. Um, I mean, I, I I didn't want to go into all those details, but it's there. 
Yes. So the show is being more detailed, but the removal is a based on the reuptake or degradation. What is that major mechanism? Yeah, it's the degradation. So in the case of dopamine and serotonin, that uh, transport or reuptake is very important. But in the cholinergic case, uh, reuptake is not a major part. No, it's not. It's the degradation. Yeah, I see. Yes. Um, in your uh, slide about you know, what does acetylcholine do, you had an explanation in terms of what behaviors they're, they're mm -hmm. involved with and what you know, brain-wide activities, you know, sleep, how they're involved with these things. So I was, if, if I was able to give you the perfect microcircuit, you know, cortical column uh, model with every detail totally worked out, how does this help us address the question of what acetylcholine does? Huh, well... Uh, I guess it's still a snapshot of what acetylcholine could do because um, there are uh, other mechanisms involved here that are absolutely not modeled, like astrocytes and vasculature. And uh, the cortex in itself um, comprises um, neurons uh, that could release acetylcholine intrinsically, uh, like VIP neurons in layer two, three, and uh, we have we haven't modeled any of that, right? So, I guess if if, the, yeah. if, if you take it as the, that the explanation for what acetylcholine does will ultimately be cashed out in terms of what behaviors is it you know involved in, then doesn't there need to be some bridge between particular behaviors? and particular uh, uh, functions of the neural activity before you can go to the microcircuit? I, I'm, I'm not seeing the bridge. Like if, even if I gave you all the details of this, this would be only a small piece of brain-wide activity related to behaviors. So I'm not sure how the details of this model will help us address the, what I, th I thought the question was, you know, what does acetylcholine does, would do? Well, Yes, the question is what acetylcholine is doing, but not brain-wide, only in a little microcircuit of the cortex. And what acetylcholine could be doing by acting on cells and synapses in this little volume of the cortex, and how by modeling the effects of acetylcholine on cells and synapses, can we try and uh, scale up? Can we try and reconcile what could be happening at the network level? Again, uh, this is an isolated model of the cortex. It does not have extrinsic projections. It does not have long range axons. So in some sense, it's a very dumbed down biased model of the cortex, right? So no, there is no way just by using this one model, can we try and say what acetylcholine could be doing across the brain. But using this model as a foundation, uh, as a starting point, the framework as a starting point, perhaps if we could try and uh, apply the same approach to model other cortical areas and connect them together, then maybe there's a way to try and predict what acetylcholine could be doing across the cortex. But just with this one model, what I'm trying to show, no, there is no way to say that. It's, it's very preliminary, it's, 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 it's a starting point, yeah. Ooh. Yes. Yeah. Um, in this small piece of um, yeah, microcircuit, and you mentioned um, it's one cholinergic synapse per neuron. Uh, more or less. More yes. Less. Do you wear that, or does the model have dendritic integration or any spatial uh, um, component? Right. So the model does. Yes, yes. So the uh, the model does have uh, lots of dendrites, but um, what we don't know is where could these cholinergic receptors be located on dendrites. Uh, so for now, uh, we just distributed cholinergic receptors randomly on dendrites because we simply don't know if a muscarinic receptor is expressed more in the apical dendrites of pyramidal cells compared to a nicotinic receptor. We just 
although we know what, what are the receptor types that could be expressed in different neurons based on transcriptomics, we do not know the spatial location of these receptors yet, right? So of course, we try to incorporate whatever receptors are known in this model, but we still don't know where these receptors could be localized. So that's something that, that needs to be quantified. Yes. Is there uh, another question or? Okay, okay. Uh, right. Okay, so, I mean, uh, yeah, I guess there are, there are a lot of questions in the, in the interim. Anyway, just to, to provide some very preliminary conclusions about um, what we tried to address with, with this model. So we asked how um, is, the, is the cholinergic projection system organized? And what we predict is that cholinergic axons mostly contact um, uh, pyramidal cells uh, in layer two, three, uh, but they also contact inhibitory um, basket cells and Martinotti cells in layer two, three. So we predict that each cholinergic fiber innovates roughly 300 uh, excitatory neurons and about 10 inhibitory neurons. And um, is cholinergic release uh, mediated via volumetric or synaptic transmission? Uh, so what we predict is high levels of volumetric transmission can bring about desynchronization and both synaptic and volumetric release have a synergistic effect. Uh, and of course, the kinetics of synaptic parameters and the way you stimulate these fibers in the model also matter. Um, and can we actually agree on the cell type specific effects of, of acetylcholine release? And can, can all this data be integrated into a, into, into a coherent framework given how sparse it is? So no matter what measurements we do, at the end of the day, this data is always going to be sparse. But integrating all this data into modeling framework enables a way to reconcile conflicting results in the literature and, and to try and integrate all the known data points. Um, by conflicting results, I mean, um, um, I, I mentioned before, you know, that there, there are studies that meant that say that about two thirds of um, uh, axons that release acetylcholine do it volumetrically. But there are some studies that just say that this is about one third, right? So who do we believe? We don't know. Do we believe their data based on the color of the shirt they were wearing when they published the study or whatever, right? So it's very random, it's very random. So integrating all these data points into a modeling framework provides us a way to try and reconcile these conflicting results and also a way to try and integrate um, all these, these known data points. So that was about all the detailed modeling part. And I also wanted to talk a bit about uh, uh, how to link uh, this detailed modeling approach with, with artificial um, neural networks. Uh, so my, my current research uh, is focused um, at the interface of, of biological and artificial neural networks. Uh, so the, the goal of my lab is to, is to really try and understand how neuromodulators that are released from different subcortical nuclei, like the, the dorsal raphe or the basal forebrain, the locus ceruleus, um, substantia nigra, the dopaminergic nuclei, how do these project to the cortex and do what they are supposed to do, right? And um, the, the approach I'm trying to take here is to combine experiments and computational modeling. Um, so to try um, and um, uh, undertake uh, slice experiments, um, in, in uh, mice, monkeys, and, and human brain tissue, applying the, the same concentration of neuromodulator in the bath and trying to record from the same kinds of neurons 
and characterizing how these neuromodulators like acetylcholine or whatever change firing activity, synaptic transmission, and, and network activity. Uh, and of course, through this endeavor, some key questions we are trying to answer are um, how are neuromodulators, the same neuromodulators organized across mouse, monkey, and human brains? Is there a similarity or are they completely different? Um, and how does one neuromodulator capitalize on increased brain complexity to try and bring about um, behavioral changes, you know, like learning and, and memory? And what can, what can artificial neural networks um, enable uh, us to understand uh, how um, these neuromodulators are doing whatever they're supposed to rather than detailed models. Um, and uh, uh, very, very recently we published a study where we, we tried to um, identify what different neuromodulators are doing across spatial in biological neural networks and which of these mechanisms has actually been implemented in, in, in neural networks, in artificial neural networks. So of course, uh, this area, uh, this territory in biological neural networks is a lot more characterized compared to uh, the implementations of these functions in their artificial counterparts. So this is very much um, evolving work. And there is a lot we can try and address by um, incorporating neuromodulators into these artificial neural networks. For example, um, you know, uh, the role of dopamine in reward assessment is of course well established, but uh, there's also a lot of evidence now that dopamine interacts with other neuromodulators like acetylcholine that could contribute to avoidance behavior and motor control, for example. And an important question is, how can you model interactions between neuromodulators in artificial neural networks? And how could these uh, bring about the emergence of synergistic behavioral effects? So this hasn't been done in the realm of neural networks. And um, noradrenaline is another important neuromodulator which uh, um, has very different projection patterns depending on where it, uh, it ends up in, in the, in the brain. Um, and this, uh, uh, these projection patterns of noradrenaline could actually modulate uh, network level parameters or so-called hyperparameters quite significantly in, in neural network models. So could multi-scale implementations of parameter update and adding projection specificity of neuromodulators like noradrenaline, can these enable artificial neural networks to somehow effectively reconfigure network level parameters? So this is quite a high-end uh, open question, and we have no idea about how to do this in, in neural networks, artificial neural networks. And um, serotonin, an important neuromodulator, something that, that, that Kenji uh, studies, uh, is thought to modulate learning and perception by activating receptor hotspots on, on, the, on the distal dendrites of neocortical pyramidal cells. Um, so although there has been some attempt to try and incorporate dendritic mechanisms in artificial neural networks, like uh, dendrify that Yota um, um, um in Greece has developed, um, this is still, um, um, you know, uh, quite emerging and an open-ended question. How can this help addressing the so-called credit assignment problem in neural networks? And is there a way to add these dendritic receptor clusters in artificial neural networks? And can this help unravel the role of neuromodulators in, in gating sensory perception? We don't know. Um, of course, um, uh, a very important question in terms of neural networks, artificial neural networks, is uh, 
how do you not, how do you model renormalization and homeostasis of synaptic strength uh, that could try and enable the consolidation of learning and memory something that's very easy and natural in biological neural networks during consolidation uh, through a process called memory replay which enables biological neural networks to overcome the so-called problem of catastrophic forgetting. But artificial neural networks cannot do this yet, cannot overcome the so-called problem of catastrophic forgetting. So if there is a way to model how neuromodulators can bring about changes across sleep and wakefulness in artificial neural networks, could this try and help mimic biological replay mechanisms and help forget or help prevent catastrophic forgetting in neural network models? So yes, I mean, um, uh, this is quite a, quite a hotly contested field and uh, very, very fertile and open uh, for, for lots and lots of work. Um, and right now we are actually uh, looking into um, the biological feasibility of many of these different uh, neuromodulatory architectures, rather neural network architectures, like uh, some of these architectures are quite emerging. Like um, there are neural networks that incorporate uh, uh, BERS CNNs or neural networks that incorporate um, um, co-populations of inhibitory and excitatory neurons or neural networks that incorporate so-called Dale's principle, you know, where the same axon can release different neurotransmitters, um, and neural networks that, in addition to neurons, also incorporate astrocytes, and neural networks that are more progressive in that, as a function of time, can they grow neural processes? Can they add dendritic spines? Can they introduce new neuron morphologies? So all this is, is, is quite new, and this is uh, very emerging. And we are trying to uh, understand how each of these different neural network architectures, depending on the kind of biological complexity, can enable or can enhance uh, learning uh, and, and memory. Um, and this is a, a, a snapshot of the, of the taxonomy of, of learning algorithms with respect to the tax, task space. So here we have different learning algorithms. So it could be neural networks that are modulated by synaptic plasticity or gradient-based or somehow regulated by evolutionary processes or even simple neural networks that are reinforcement learning-based. But what can, what can they achieve in terms of tasks, right? So what can they do in terms of decision-making, navigation, motor control, so on, right? So this is really like a, like a huge, huge, huge parameter space. And we are trying to understand uh, how adding biological complexity, how enhancing biological complexity in these neural network architectures can help solve a spectrum of these uh, task spaces that are currently being implemented in uh, AI, AI architectures. So what we're trying to do now is a dual framework to study biological learning, where we start from a detailed representation of a, of a neural network model, something that I, I, I spoke to you about. And how can we try and encapsulate, how can we preserve some of this detail um, in, a, in a more simplified representation, you know, where we don't have axons or dendrites or whatever, but we have different neuron populations um, that, that are represented in, a, in an artificial neural network architecture. And how can we translate all this biological complexity into something that's more simplified um, that will enable us to then try and predict what neuromodulators or neuromodulator interactions can be doing um, to bring about continual or lifelong learning uh, in, in neural networks. 
and uh, finally um, of course um, as kenji said um, uh, we are uh, organizing this uh, workshop as part of the tsvp neuromodulation of adaptive learning the goal is to really try and understand uh, theoretical lessons uh, to try and link uh, learning that's enabled by neuromodulators from invertebrate to vertebrate brains um, and um, to, to really try and answer this question of whether these neuromodulatory systems are conserved across species. Could, could the same neuromodulator be doing something similar across species or depending on the complexity of neural networks, uh, is this completely different? So, so what do we know about neuromodulation and learning across species? Uh, and uh, finally, um, I would I would really like to thank all 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 my funders and uh, especially the 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 TSVP here at OIST. So uh, Jonas and Haruka and uh, and Eugen uh, for their amazing support in uh, in enabling all this, and of course to 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 Kenji for his constant uh, guidance and and advice. Uh, and finally, uh, so you know we we are. Uh, uh, slightly far geographically from Okinawa in a completely different environment. So in the in the north of England uh, at at Newcastle. So this is actually a fantastic place, although although the the weather might not be as good as it is here. Um, uh, so yes, um, so we're a, we're a very fledgling lab. We're uh, working at the interface of biological and um, and artificial neural networks. So um, uh, I'm I'm very keen um, to to establish collaborations here at uh, at OIST and learn from uh, this uh, awesome multidisciplinary ecosystem here. So yes, please uh, help spread the word about our mission, and uh, I'm 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 happy to 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 discuss and interact and uh, and anything that will. Uh, uh, kind of lay the foundation towards um, a program in understanding the effects of neuromodulators across species and how they contribute to learning in neural networks. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Srikans. So uh, questions? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, do you have any examples of uh, new architectures that in are incorporating the sleep-like states that you're talking about? Uh, there are some examples from uh, Magazine Buzz and Oz group, but again, that's very limited to the hippocampus. Um, and of course, uh, all kinds of brain regions are involved in sleep. Um, and um, we don't really have a universal representation of a network architecture to encode sleep yet. So it's very, I'd say it's very region specific. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Uh, first of all, it's a beautiful lecture. I'm happy to be here. Um, I was wondering about the methodology that you decide whether a um, synaptic transmission uh, Transmission is synaptic or volumetric? Uh, methodology. Well, actually, right now there is no method. It's just random. So we we assume that about half of synaptic contacts release acetylcholine synaptically and the rest release volumetrically. So, in I mean, you're probably asking what's the method in the model? Or, right, no, I mean, there's no method there. We're just assuming because we still don't know for sure uh, what's happening. But then how can you be sure there is a volumetric release? Well, we the... know there's, that there is volumetric transmission uh, for sure. Um, so one way this can be uh, quantified experimentally is um, by looking at uh, the dimensions of varicosities under electron microscopy. So if uh, there is synaptic release, then um, the varicosities tend to be bigger. 
because they need to establish uh, a synaptic contact uh, with uh, a postsynaptic uh, dendritic compartment. But if it's only volumetric release, um, then the size of the varicosity is going to be much smaller. So this is one way to try and know if um, neuromodulatory release is synaptic versus volumetric. I see. For then, um, lastly, I am wondering if there is a way for you to know if the connection is the volumetric or synaptic before it forms a connection, like, for example, a genetic marker. Uh, yes, that's possible. But again, um, we don't know how this is going to change across development. Mm. So it could be that uh, with a genetic marker, you could try and say that one one connection is volumetric at some point in time, but it's probably going to change across development. And this is something we don't know how to measure yet. I see they, then from my, from what I'm, I understood, they also change their synaptic transmission types along the way. So the volumetric transmission could turn into a synaptic one? Yeah, uh, that's possible. And I think that that depends on the background brain state. Yes. Okay, thank you. Sure. Other questions? Thank you. Um, in your model, uh, you were showing that uh, with uh, cholinergic input, you get desynchronization of neural activity, which agrees with uh, like empirical data, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, in your model, did you observe I guess if you did do this, like if you desynchronize neural activity and then you cut off uh, cholinergic input, um, I assume the network resynchronizes. Uh, yes, we we did see that. Sure. And sure. and if that happens, does it does it sort of enter the same synchronous state or a different synchronous state? Because I assume there's multiple ways that the whole network could be synchronized, depending on like which populations are sort of phase lock with each other or whatever. Sure. So uh, the way we define synchrony here is uh, based on um, low frequency, slow oscillations uh, that are anywhere between 0.1 and 1 hertz that really tries uh, to replicate network oscillations under NREM sleep. And uh, yes, we do see um, that uh, the network oscillates in this regime by cutting off uh, cholinergic uh, activity. Yes. Um, but then is, is I guess, uh, have you checked if it's like, well, I'm ignorant of the details of, of your mm -hmm. neuron model, so I, I don't know if this is a relevant question or not, but like um, in like, a, like oscillator models, you know, you can you can have like different subsets of neurons lock like sort of phase lock sure, with each other. Sure. So I guess my question is, do you does it does it does it fall back into the same state that it was in originally, or when you desynchronize it and resynchronize it, does it does it enter a new synchronous state? Uh, no, I would say that it falls back pretty much into the same state. But again, um, we haven't looked into this in more detail because it's quite a range from 0.1 to one hertz. So where exactly it falls in the spectrum is something that we haven't looked at. We, we know that it kind of comes back into the realm of the spectrum, but where exactly does the peak of the curve lie uh, along the spectrum? We haven't looked into that, no. Thank you. Okay, so there will be some more uh, discussions, but uh, for the interest of time, uh, let us uh, close uh, sure. uh, the seminar now. Okay, thank you very much, Srikans. Okay, sure. Thank you.